Hi, I'm Dr. Andy Martin. We're here at Mount Sinai. I'm clinical professor of cardiovascular surgery. I'm thrilled to have two of my colleagues, Demos Pandas. Demos is an assistant professor of cardiovascular surgery and is also the associate director of clinical research and education. And Dr. Mark Miller. Mark's a cardiologist, but an important cardiologist, as most cardiologists are. But he's he's the uh, is the head of the cardiac arrhythmia service. Uh, in the Cardiovascular Institute, and one of the things we've talked about is a team approach to problems, and I think what we're going to talk about here is really uh, a great example of this. So this really comes to the topic that we know of people who have mitral valve prolapse and who experience sudden cardiac events, sudden cardiac death, and we've learned a lot about that over the, over the period of the year. So Demos, why don't you start us out and give us a little bit of a historical perspective of that. Thank you, Randy. It's great to be here and discussing this very important matter, mostly uh, because it's it's gained this crescendo of interest in, in the last about 10 years because right. it concerns a part of the population that uh, are affected at an otherwise benign disease, which is uh, uh, mitral valve prolapse, as you well said. Mitral valve disease, mitral valve prolapse, you know, being the most common uh, valvular heart disease uh, uh, in, in the world currently and uh, also in the United States affecting about about 3% of its population. Now, um, we know that the majority of these patients are afflicted by uh, uh, ventricular ectopy, uh, which is not always something very significant. But however, uh, we've come to realize uh, with uh, recent data, more cohesive data, uh, that there is this part of the population even smaller than that 60, but it's about 2% of these patients with mitral valve prolapse that can have significant uh, ectopy and sudden death. So you're talking. So what you're saying, we got a lot of people with mitral regurgitation and mitral valve prolapse. We have some of those, or a lot of those, might have isolated ectopy, isolated PVCs and stuff. But there is a subgroup which makes up. You said 1.8 percent of those patients who could have, who could be at at risk for or have had cardiac arrest? Exactly, and this is what makes it difficult for us to find a way to stratify these patients and to, to make a, some kind of a meaningful understanding of whatever reported data has been available to us over the past decade so we can advise uh, our patients. Yeah, because you know we see, and I'm sure Mark, you may be by where you are now with this level of sophistication, but we've seen for years patients who come in and say, I'm, my heart's beating irregularly and you've got some isolated PVCs and they might have a little bit of mitral regurg. The question really is who's at risk and how do we determine that and, and then how do we treat it? So why don't you continue? So that's good. So the risk, it's a small pool but a very significant pool. Of course we don't want to be in that point two, you know, 2% right. that might end up uh, having a very short life otherwise because these patients uh, under uh, 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 early surgery and treatment, they go up to have a, uh, a life expectancy of uh, nearly to the healthy population. So um, we need to prevent this and we need to be able to find a way to isolate these patients and to make sure that they are seeing a specialist early on in their, in their disease process. So was there, there has been a feeling that if you had mitral valve prolapse and you had significant mitral regurgitation and PVCs that you were in that group. But you're going to tell me that that might not be the case. So I think a couple of things. One is I think that's a very important point earlier about the risk of sudden death is that very often we think of more common substrates for sudden death like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy right. that everyone knows about, everyone recognizes as a risk. But based on the number of patients in the United States that have mitral valve prolapse, more patients are likely dying of sudden death due to mitral valve prolapse than due to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. It's estimated about 25,000 patients a year uh, in the United States alone. One of the common misconceptions, to your point, is years ago when you went to a cardiologist, if you had bileaflet prolapse with a little bit of MR and some PVCs, ultimately what they'd always say is, don't worry about it, it's a benign condition, just go about your life and get an echo every few years. And we know that's not the case anymore. Besides the actual risk, we know that most sudden deaths actually occur in patients with just mild MR. And I'll just show you one that's, slide that's here. That's interesting. This is from one particular study where they looked at all the patients who actually had MVP-related sudden death, and more than 80% of them occurred in patients with less than severe MR. If you just look at the well, numbers... Well, trivial there, and mild, and it's the majority. Exactly. So 
it's important not to associate that the risk is only in those patients with significant mitral regurgitation. It's actually quite the opposite. Okay, and that makes a thing a, a two-pronged approach, which is necessary for us not only for us to understand it, but also educate the patients that the context of the severity of the disease is not necessarily the driving force that they should be having or building a, a relationship with the physician. And I'm not sure that the vast majority of cardiologists appreciate that fact at this point. I think it is the least known fact yes, in no MVP doubt. related sudden death. No doubt, no doubt. So about 10% of our own population has been referred to us for surgery, mind you, with significant mitral regurgitation for, for surgery. Uh, their physicians have actually associated their concomitant presence of ventricular ectopy uh, with their mitral uh, prolapse, which you know says a lot. So, for, so let me, and I know you're gonna talk, you're both gonna talk me through this, but if, so if, if I, you, yeah, that's fine, but so if you're telling me that I don't, you know, it's not necessarily the people that have severe MR, is it the people who come in, I'm thinking of patients of mine that I've sent up here, uh, you, you guys have worked on, patients who have frequent ectomy could have couplets, you know, not, not any known history of malignant arrhythmias, but have bi-wafer prolapse with moderate MR. Just, just you, you, you started at the outset that just PVCs alone even in the presence of bi-wafer prolapse is not necessarily the substate that's going to have sudden cardiac death. No, and unfortunately, you know, PVCs are so common as pointed out that, you know, 60 to 70 percent of patients have PVCs. So it's just way too nonspecific and sensitive to use that as a marker of sudden death in and of itself. To your point, just to show you here, is that there's, there's two groups of patients. There's a group of patients with mitral valve prolapse of which at least two-thirds have PVCs. But if you look at just the patients who had sudden death, 100% of them have PVC. So if you start, if a patient has no ventricular ectopy, then obviously I think they automatically fall into a low risk category. If they have C ventricular ectopy, and to me burden is less important than complexity, mm -hmm. which I'll get to in a minute, okay. is those obviously are the patients you want to at least start to explore a little bit more. There's, two, there's a couple of things about ventricular ectopy. One is the complexity. For example, if they have couplets and triplets, to me, that's a higher risk than if someone just has a high burden of single morphology PVCs. Okay. If people have two or three different morphologies on the Holter, that to me is higher risk than someone who has a single morphology with a high burden. What we also know is that location does matter. It's like real estate <laughs> in the sense that most patients who've had malignant events, usually at least one of their morphologies is coming from the papillary muscle or other areas that we call the Purkinje system. So if it's purely outflow tract PVCs, it's probably less important, at least the data that we have, than for example patients who have Purkinje related PVCs. Okay. And I think what Mark says is uh, reflective of how far we've come along yeah. since the past 10, 15 years. Well, we only identified this constellation of characteristics that were identified in this patient with mitral prolapse, regardless of severity of MR. And those were those abnormal EKG findings like uh, inverse uh, T, T waves, waves like uh, infra patterns on right. the inferior right. leads or uh, uh, conduction delays or, uh, you know, patients that were those that ended up having those events were you know, younger patients, predominantly females. But now, as Mara pointed out, uh, we've now gone and identified in very granularly right. a lot more of the, the, the morphology of the, uh, of the, and the complexity and, of, of those activities. Yeah, I mean, you're, I mean it's, this is fabulous because you're really telling me stuff that I didn't know or I wasn't up to date with, is that basically the, the two facts that you've mentioned is not necessarily you have to have some significant MR, and two, that it's really the complexity of the PVCs. As opposed to the burden. And poor, right. Opposed to just unit, yeah. And so that's. I'll make just one other comment in regards okay. to this is so, you know, this seems complicated to it a does. non electrophysiologist, and does. I totally understand that. But <laughs> that's why you're here. <laughs> very, very often, what we talk about in the literature, or at least the early literature, was just using the term ventricular arrhythmia. And I do think that there are different categories of ventricular arrhythmias and the mechanisms that predispose you to those arrhythmias are actually related to the interplay between the prolapse and the substrate. And so hopefully in the future, we'll start to clarify the difference between a monomorphic ventricular tachycardia that's due to something like triggered activity, which should resolve with surgery, versus monomorphic ventricular tachycardia that's due to scar that already exists, that the risk will be there irrespective of the surgical intervention. And you just mentioned now one of those characteristics that are 
usually finding in, in these patients, and we like to use as markers to keep these patients under the radar, like for example, myocardial scar and its distribution. So we, we've also uh, gone far a long way right. identifying uh, not only how important that is, but its location and how we can uh, how we can use this uh, f to certify Mark, these patients. Mark, go back one slide because you you were talking. And I was trying to concentrate. So. The difference, tell me what, what you're trying to show, or tell us and me and the audience what you're trying to show with these two. Sure, I'll give you an example. So the bottom left hand of the screen here okay. is an example of monomorphic ventricular tachycardia okay. in a patient with severe MR. Okay. That the mechanism appears related more to what we call triggered activity, so is irritation of the papillary muscle from the prolapsing leaflet, okay. and it just has that characteristic. Now, why is that important? Because this patient with this type of arrhythmia, even though it's monomorphic VT, is very low risk for sudden death. And this patient, if you fix the mechanical forces during surgery, th it will resolve. Okay. And that's exactly what happened in this case. Most people would look at that and say, gee, you know, I think you know, we need to do something besides surgery. Correct, and I patient. think that's where one is having, you know, the more patients you see and the more you kind of put them into their correct categories, the easier the outcomes or predicting the outcomes will be. Okay. And that's a lot different than the patient here in the right upper hand column okay. here, this was a patient who already had surgery years ago, who okay. had monomorphic VT that was simply related to scar. So similar arrhythmia, completely different mechanisms, the interventions are completely different. Okay. So hopefully in the future, rather than in these prospective trials that will be ongoing, they'll start to clarify the types of arrhythmias rather than one broad category and their mechanisms. Okay. And the okay. context here would be that we, we are lost because we are looking at this retrospective scope from the back end. Right. We've known the event at the end and we tried to figure out what the steps were that initiated all this process and so far we just accepted the obvious and the obvious was excess, pro, excess prolapse, excess right, right. Uh, uh, excursion of the leaflet, excess tugging and that means myocardial injury. However, We've also known for many years since our anatomy, uh, uh, understanding of the anatomy, that uh, my myocytes are built for that. Right. They're built for cyclical s contraction and relaxation right. during, so uh, they have ways to, to counteract the excessive inflammatory response. So there has to be an additional way or additional signaling pathway that ends up not having the same effect to the, these types of patients that are exposed to the same risk factor. They're all prolapsing, okay. but not all of them have ectopy. And as Mark said, not all of them have exactly the same substrate because of their, the, the, the way that their, the, the my, myocardial injury, the scar, is distributed. Somewhere it's focal, and other patients is more diffuse, and we're still working out what the role is in, and how has this been going about and its relationship to the manifestation of the ventricular activity. So, so I'm still trying to think who's at risk here. Is this gonna, you're gonna help me know the patients that might be at risk? We're talking about substrates, but I wanna know the patients that might be at risk. So I think, my personal belief is that it is a accumulation of risk factors okay. like every other disease. It's not just one risk no, factor, I'm, it's I'm, usually multiple risk factors. So a few years ago, at least based on the literature, there's a, a fair number of studies at that point looking at patients with malignant mitral valve prolapse, meaning those are patients who've already had events. Mm -hmm. And we tried to put together um, what we believe to be some of the risk factors necessary for patients to have cardiac arrest in the future. And so in this particular figure here, what you see in the middle, in the triangle, are the identified risk factors. How much they're weighted, we don't know yet. And on the outside, is the environmental factors which contribute to it as well. So to give you an example, we know that female gender is higher risk than male gender. Okay. We know younger is higher risk than older. Okay. We know that from an individual risk factor, it is worse to have severe MR than it is to have mild MR. Though on a population level, many more patients with mild MR are having sudden death. Bileaflet prolapse is worse than unileaflet prolapse. Complex ventricular ectopy, such as multiple morphologies right. is worse. The next one is forms of mechanical traction. So the pickle hop sign where you see high velocities on the annulus seems to be a risk factor for the development of ventricular and, tachycardia. And is that more common with bileaflet prolapse? Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure if it's more common with bileaflet prolapse. You as the echocardiographer would let me know. Yeah, yeah, you see it. It's more pronounced in patients with have more redundancy. So yeah. whether or not there is 
by leaflet or not, it's it's usually the posterior leaflet that will result into this type of uh, people went crazy on sign. annular disjunction. So okay. that's that's the one I want to. So the next one up there is mitral annular disjunction and myocardial fibrosis. Okay. So. In electrophysiology, every patient who has sudden death, almost every patient has some form of substrate, meaning whether or not it's inflammation or fibrosis, there has to be something that perpetuates the ventricular arrhythmia. Okay. The one below that, mitral angiogenic disjunction, is probably the most controversial one, as yes. you pointed out, because early on, there were many associations with mitral angiogenic disjunction and ventricular arrhythmias. The problem is, and I think we're now learning this, is that mitral annular disjunction is overdiagnosed, overemphasized. And so there was a nice UK Biobank study recently which took all these healthy patients who got cardiac MRIs, about 2,000 patients, and if they just used traditional criteria for mitral annular disjunction, 75% of the patients, of healthy patients, would have mitral annular disjunction. <laughs> Importantly, the only one that was associated with prolapse was infralateral adjacent right. to the P2. So the reality is is that it's probably very location specific and it's related to the distance. So two millimeters is probably irrelevant. 10 millimeters it's adjacent relevant. to P2 yeah. is probably a risk but factor. So, so you're, and, and this is really good. I mean, you're, so you're painting a picture that, that we need, you know, needs, that people need to know about. I mean, you've gone through other, other things I think we've here. delved a lot deeper than just the picture. We, I think we, we've identified very specific imaging uh, and uh, uh, electrocardiography so, markers. So, yeah, no, and I'm sorry, I don't mean to cut you off, and but you've got fibrosis in there. Yes. So you're looking at SCAR? Cardiac in, MRI in, with SCAR. Okay. And then what? And what now you're going to wonder what's on what, the outside. Tell, tell right. me. <laughs> so <laughs> the so outside blind. is... You know, this is the idea that for why does a ventricular why does sudden death happen on a Tuesday versus a Friday in a given Correct. patient? And so a couple of things have to happen. One is you have to have a trigger, so something to initiate the event. Classically a PVC, a short coupled PVC okay. is an example. Then you have to have something that perpetuates it, such as the myocardial scar. But why it happens on a Tuesday versus a Thursday probably has a lot to do with your adrenergic tone. For example, what we call a transient modulator. There's good data that an overwhelming majority of sudden deaths in MVP occur in patients, for example, during an argument. Uh, one of my patients was waiting for her first job interview. She had sudden death in the lobby. Other patients are nervous about uh, a speech they're about to give. It's Takasubu. I it, mean, it's basically, it's, uh, you know, it, it's you know what I'm talking about. Surge. It's a catecholamine surge. Right. It's, it's catecholamine so this catecholamine surge. surge is probably what contributes to it. Why what it about happened exercise? Just now. There is, it is exercise related in a lot of these patients. It almost never happens, as far as I know, during and sleep. Any of those stressors that will uh, increase your catecholamine levels can instigate, in the presence of, in the, the, presence substrate, of the substrate, the, okay. qu the question is, uh, we've understood and we've accepted that connection, that you need to have that spark, like you said, but, and but we you need to have the substrate. Yeah, I mean, and I think the substrate, you can't certainly can't keep people from having you know, Correct. This, this well, th there, there is, so the scar is a definitive end point of a process, which is, is, is irreversible. And having, uh, having uh, arrived at a moment to understand this, uh, I think it's now time that we started to appreciate the importance of what happens before this end point. Right. And the, you know, from the, through these patients that have much of our prolapse and a progressive severity of MR from the beginning of their lives, because this is one of the most common heritable diseases, right. we know that this is volume loading from for decades. And the wonder of the myocardium is that it feels every, every change from shear stress, from for any kind of forces, right. and it starts this inflammatory process way before it can be perceived by the patient or identified by any kind of uh, uh, diagnostic tests. And by the time we see this, it's way too late. So perhaps one of the aspects that we, we should be looking at is not what happens to the patients that actually have established scar, but patients that have had a myocardial injury and development because of the inflammation for reasons that might be contributory uh, from the prolapse. So how do I work this patient up? Right, so I think it would, be, it, it would be a good example now, like we'll take an example of where I think all of this was put together into a patient, okay. actually by a different group of cardiologists. Okay, we saw this patient as a second opinion, but it's nice to see that in 2023, this patient is 
being treated differently than they would have in, for example, 2018. Okay. We learned a lot in that discussion about arrhythmic mitral valve prolapse. In part two, we're going to look at a case and tie it all together. I hope you'll join us.